Coming up on the program, senior U.S. Justice Department official quit server directive to investigate alleged irregularities in the presidential election. Armenia, Azerbaijan and Russia sign agreements to end military conflict in the disputed enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh. Former British Prime Minister John Major says Brexit may be even more brutal than expected. Welcome to the program. I'm Joker Rogers. The U.S. Attorney General has allowed prosecutors to investigate alleged irregularities in the presidential election, prompting a senior Justice Department official to quit. William Barr adds that inquiries should only be into apparently credible claims. But the Justice Department official who would have overseen such investigations, Richard Pilger, quits in response to Mr. Barr's directive. Meanwhile, President Donald Trump's spokeswoman says the legal battle to contest Joe Biden's White House election victory has just begun. Our position is clear. We want to protect the franchise of the American people. We want an honest, accurate, lawful count. We want maximum sunlight. We want maximum transparency. We want every legal vote to be counted and we want every illegal vote to be discarded. Two new lawsuits were filed today by people who were working, who were working in Detroit and a whistleblower who has gotten their information, we have gotten their information to the Eastern District Court of Michigan. As you guys can understand with 2,800 incident reports, this is a lot to track down. It means we're interviewing these people, we're getting their statements and we're turning them into affidavits. But that takes a lot of time and effort. Well, our correspondent uh, in Washington, D.C., Maria Bird, joins us now. Maria, uh, what impact is this legal challenge from the Trump camp likely to have on the transition process? Yes, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for having me. This process will likely have um, a real effect on basically trying to get through to the transition of the president-elect. Uh, the likelihood of this leading to a, re a potentially a, a reclaiming of who is the actual president-elect is highly unlikely. But what this will do is slow down the process for transition. Um, it will obviously be extremely expensive on the on the part of the uh, president, uh, President Trump. And it will also require uh, that this is, you know, just more of a questioning of the democracy in the U.S. Um, it will just make the, the process a bit harder and continue to divide the country, which I think is what uh, the president-elect is hoping not to do. He's hoping to unify the country uh, moving forward. Attorney General says prosecutors can investigate alleged irregularities in the presidential election. Now, this is something usually left to states to handle. What's the significance of this federal intervention? Um, obviously, we know uh, that Attorney General Barr has been a longtime supporter and um, been very supportive of the actions and the requirements of the president. And so this is just another uh, case where he is following along with what the president is asking for. Uh, but as you said, this is why the states typically are the ones that will lead through this type of process. And as you mentioned earlier, uh, we've seen one of the top officials that would be doing the investigation for elections uh, to resign. And so that is a clear indication that this is out of the typical bounds and a, and a typical process for how you would uh, question and potentially file a lawsuit against um, an election. So how are the people reacting to this resignation and what will be the process to replace him? Um, his resignation is, I think, further uh, putting into question uh, the lawsuits that are being filed. And it is really, I think, for those who are questioning democracy in America, um, especially those who are of the Republican Party and potentially supporters of Trump, it is calling them to question whether or not uh, this process was done fairly and for them to say maybe there is no fraud. Uh, maybe there is nothing that um, was done and not in accordance with the typical election law. And so I think that is kind of a stand to say that the democracy in America is strong, is viable, um, and that this will um, definitely be something that hopefully will be in the distant future in America way to move forward in a unified manner. Right. Thank you so much for your thoughts on that. Our uh, Washington, D.C. correspondent, uh, Maria Bird, speaking to us on the latest developments there. Thank you. Meanwhile, the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen says the United States and the European Union need to forge 
a new transatlantic alliance in areas such as climate change and the digital economy under President-elect Joe Biden. In an address to EU ambassadors, the former German Defense Minister congratulated Mr. Biden and U.S. Vice President-elect Kamala Harris on their victory, but did not mention outgoing President Donald Trump, who has not conceded to his opponent. The Commission the President adds that it's time to reverse the trend of weakening multilateral organizations such as the United Nations, the World Health Organization and the World Trade Organization with reforms where appropriate. I want Our alliance is based on shared values and history, on a common belief in working together to build a stronger, more peaceful and more prosperous world. And these goals will always endure. But in a changing global landscape, I believe it is time for a new transatlantic agenda fit for today's world. We need strong institutions, backed by strong commitment from member countries. Our international system has been held hostage for too many years now, so the time has come to reverse the trend to reform those institutions that need reform and to revive multilateral deals that are essential for our common security, to create new coalitions on the most pressing issues of our times. Armenia, Azerbaijan and Russia have signed an agreement to end military conflict over the disputed enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh. In a statement, Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan says the deal is incredibly painful both for him and his people. This follows six weeks of fighting between Azerbaijan and ethnic Armenians. The region is internationally recognized as Azerbaijani but has been run by ethnic Armenians since 1994. A Russian brokered truce was signed at the end of the war in the early 1990s but there was no peace deal then. The news led to scenes of national celebration in Azerbaijan's capital, Baku. The streets were rammed with traffic as people danced on cars waving the flags of both Azerbaijan and Turkey. But the mood was very different in Armenia. Soon after the announcement of the peace deal, hundreds of people broke into government buildings. Thousands also streamed to the main square of the Armenian capital, Yerevan, to protest the agreement, many shouting, we won't give up our land. The former Soviet states of Azerbaijan and Armenia fought a bloody war over the mountainous regions of Nagorno-Karabakh in the early 1990s. Thousands were killed on both sides and hundreds of thousands were displaced. The war ended with a truce in 1994, although there has been sporadic violence since then. The latest flare-up of violence between Armenian and Azerbaijani forces over the Nagorno-Karabakh region started on September 27th and has left hundreds of people dead. Several ceasefires have been called but were mostly immediately violated by both parties. The latest agreement, brokered by Russia, calls for the deployment of nearly 2,000 Russian peacekeepers as well as territorial concessions. Turkey will also take part in the peacekeeping process. The deal also calls for Armenian forces to hand over control to Azerbaijan of some areas it held outside the borders of the region. Baku will also hold on to areas of the region that it has taken during the violence. Well, the VOS Charles Main joins us live from Moscow for more on the story. Charles, tell us more about the Nagorno-Karabakh peace deal brokered by Russia. Well, I think your piece set it up nicely. I mean, it's, it's no doubt there's, this is a win for Azerbaijan. Uh, the agreement solidified gains by the Azerbaijani military, uh, whose larger military force, frankly, has been strengthened even further 
uh, by advanced weaponry and support from its ally, Turkey, over the past six weeks. Uh, the deal's key provision, uh, the complete withdrawal of Armenian forces and the immediate deployment of Russian peacekeepers to the territory. Uh, the status of Nagorno-Karabakh, however, remains uh, unaddressed. This is, of course, the ethnically Armenian enclave inside Azerbaijan. Um, but Armenia agreed to return uh, territories that, uh, that were now under Azeri control, which means walking back essentially many of the gains that they had from the war in the 1990s when Armenia had the upper hand. And, of course, that war led to 30,000 uh, deaths and also displaced uh, over a million people, many of them are Azerbaijanis. So, of course, in, in that sense, this means a chance for many of those people uh, to return home after many years. So do we know if you know, both sides will uphold this deal or are there fears that the agreements may not hold? Well, you know, we've had three uh, you know, ceasefires that have been broken so far. Uh, and, of course, we're talking about a frozen conflict that's been going on for 30 years now. So I understand the skepticism in that sense. Um, I think what's different here is we see the leaders of countries uh, negotiating at the top level before it was foreign ministers. Um, so in that sense, I think there's probably more chance of things holding. Uh, there's some questions certainly over uh, the, the staying power of uh, Prime Minister Vashanyan um, in Armenia, given that uh, it, his decision was very unpopular. He says he was bending to the realities on the ground, the military situation, that he, uh, which was backed up, frankly, by the leadership of Nagorno-Karabakh, the Armenian ethnic uh, leadership, saying that had they not signed this deal, uh, Azerbaijan would have taken the whole territory. Um, but essentially, I think that the Russian presence here, the peacekeepers you mentioned in your opening piece, uh, they at least provide a blanket of support to keeping this ceasefire deal in place in the sense that nobody wants to provoke Russia into the fight. So, Charles, finally, tell us what's Russia's interest in this conflict? Well, uh, you know, this is their geopolitical backyard. Of course, uh, you mentioned that uh, these are former Soviet republics where Moscow had a lot of sway. Uh, in fact, it still does uh, to a certain degree. Uh, Russia, along with the U.S. and France, has been part of this effort to negotiate a ceasefire for over nearly 30 years now. Um, I think if you talk to people here who follow uh, the South Caucasus issues, they'll say that Russia, in some ways, was quite satisfied with the, with the status quo. Uh, they have good relations with Armenia and Azerbaijan. They uh, sell weapons to both sides. So in some ways, um, this was fine for them as, as things were. What happened here is that a new player came into the, into the area, and that's Turkey. Uh, and Turkey has essentially shifted the power dynamic in the area, uh, which is maybe not to Moscow's liking, but I think this ceasefire deal in some ways is Moscow making the best of a bad situation. Uh, they're acknowledging the fact that Turkey has a role to play, Yet at the same time, they're still able to call some of the shots, including these peacekeepers uh, who will be now in, in place for the next five years. Thank you so much for that update. Uh, the VO is Charles Main joining us live from Moscow on that. Thank you. Other stories. Three men have gone on trial in Spain amid tight security over two deadly jihadist attacks that killed 16 people and injured 140 others in and around Barcelona in 2017. The trio are accused of helping the perpetrators, who are all shot dead by police, carry out the attacks. One of the perpetrators rammed a van into pedestrians in Barcelona's Las Ramblas tourist area before a twin attack was launched in a nearby town. The Islamic State group said it had carried out the attacks. President Emmanuel Macron has held talks with Australian, Austrian Chancellor Sebastian Kurz in Paris. The two leaders also joined in on a phone call with the leaders of Germany and the European Commission, among others. Mr. Macron, Mr. Kurz, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel and the EU Commission and Council Presidents are expected to give a news conference later on. The meeting comes after a spat of deadly Islamist attacks in France and Austria in recent weeks. On October 16th, history teacher Samuel Paty was murdered outside his school near Paris in broad daylight. On October 29th, three people were also killed following a knife attack at a church in the southern French city of Nice. Four days later, a gunman was shot dead by police in Austria after going on a shooting rampage to the capital, killing four people. And still to come on the program.
Britain's Prince Charles gives a last hour warning over climate change. That's in a moment. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the program. Former British Prime Minister Sir John Major says Brexit may be even more brutal than expected due to the UK's negotiating failures. In a speech in London, the ex-Prime Minister adds that the UK's inflexibility and treats towards the EU would make future trade less profitable. He also warned of the corrosive impact to the UK's reputation of a proposed law giving ministers the power to override aspects of the Brexit agreement. This comes as the House of Lords rejected parts of the internal market bill. Peers removed a series of clauses which would give the UK the right to disregard obligations in the withdrawal agreement with the EU in relation to Northern Ireland, defeating the government twice by huge margins. Former Malian President Amadou Toumani Touri has died at the age of 72. He died early today in Turkey, where he was undergoing treatment. He arrived in the Turkish commercial capital Istanbul a few days ago. Before his departure from Mali, he had undergone an emergency heart surgery in the capital Bamako. Mr. Touri was Mali's president from 2002 until he was deposed by a military coup in March 2012 that was led by General Amadou Haya Sanogo. Mr. Toure, an army general, was held for ending years of military rule and handing power to civilians after organizing elections in 1992. Based on this, he was nicknamed the Soldier of Democracy. One of the most prominent Palestinian political figures, Saeb Erekat, has died with COVID-19. The 65-year-old passed away in Jerusalem at the Hadassah Medical Center, where he had been admitted last month after being diagnosed with the virus. Erekat led the Palestinians in on off-peace talks with Israel for many years. Describing Erekat as a brother and a fighter, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas declared three days of national mourning. Arakat was Secretary General of the main Palestinian movement, the Palestine Liberation Organization, and an advisor to Mr. Abbas. He helped negotiate the landmark Oslo Accords in 1993, which created the Palestinian Authority and gave Palestinians limited self-governance in the West Bank and Gaza Strip for the first time since Israel occupied the territories in 1967. Raising hopes for a major victory in the fight against the coronavirus pandemic, drug makers Pfizer and BioNTech say their experimental vaccine may be 90% effective at preventing COVID-19. However, the announcement on Monday has received mixed reactions from across the world as scientists and doctors caution many questions uh, remain unanswered and warn any celebration would be premature. Here's more on this on our COVID-19 Global Update. Spain's health ministry says the country would get the first vaccines against COVID-19 developed by U.S. pharmaceuticals Pfizer and its partner BioNTech in early 2021. Residents in Madrid expressed confidence that the vaccine could provide a way out of the pandemic. But Germans on the streets of Munich expressed both enthusiasm and skepticism. The European Commission on its part says it's in final stages of talks with BioNTech Pfizer over the supply of 200 million doses of their potential COVID-19 shot with an option to buy another 100 million. 
far. While Londoners welcome the news, many say they want more information about the vaccine before taking it. I think we've had, we've had a public announcement that the vaccine looks promising. There's no real detail there yet. So, uh, no, I'd want to hear, uh, hear more, no more. But certainly when a vaccine is developed, I would, I would be in line to take it, yeah. I mean, it's really positive, but I think it is a long way still. But I think that's what we needed to hear. You know, it gives you a boost to think that there's a way out of this and, it's, and that it's happening soon. The British government has asked the National Health Service to be ready to deploy any COVID vaccine from the start of December before it will roll it out, starting with the most vulnerable. In less promising developments, the Brazilian clinical trial for a Chinese COVID-19 vaccine has been suspended after health authorities reported a severe adverse incident. Brazilian health regulator Anvisa says the incident took place on October 29th but did not give further details. The Coronavac vaccine developed by the Chinese firm Sinovac Biotech is one of several in final stage testing globally. Sinovac says it's confident in the safety of the vaccine. Britain's heir to the throne, Prince Charles, says that companies must put nature and sustainability at the heart of their business models because the world is literally at the last hour in the fight against climate change. The 71-year-old prince, a campaigner on green issues, adds that the economic recovery from the coronavirus pandemic presents an unprecedented opportunity for a shift towards a sustainable model. His call comes a day after Britain's financial watchdog said from January, companies listed on the London Stock Exchange would have to improve disclosures on the risks they're facing from climate change. By leveraging market forces and the immense resources of the private sector, there is hope that we can transform the situation. But I'm afraid we are literally at the last hour and there is real urgency for action. We know now what we have to do to rescue the situation, rather than going on talking about it. Now, I have long believed that we need a shift in our economic model that places nature and the world's transition to net zero at the heart of how we operate, prioritizing the pursuit of sustainable, inclusive growth in the decades to come. The only way, ladies and gentlemen, to reduce emissions at the scale required, short of a ban on fossil fuels, is to accelerate the development, implementation and scaling up of carbon capture use and storage, both nature-based and engineered, to buy us a precious time while allowing us uh, rapidly to draw down carbon emissions as we transition towards a net zero global economy. We must start accounting for natural capital on companies' balance sheets. Without this, firms simply cannot tell the true value of their asset base, nor how damaging their operations may be on the natural world. So we must put nature and sustainability at the center of companies' business models, their analysis, decisions and actions, and ask them to report on it. That's the world today. Thank you for watching. I'm Joaquin Rogers.